Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture on chapter three for the science of nutrition. Um, in chapter three, we're gonna start to kind of move away from some of the introductory topics and start to get a little more into the nitty gritty science. Uh, so chapter three is gonna start with some of the um, like psychological and sociological um, influences on eating and kind of setting the setting a basic understanding for why we eat, which is I think an important understanding, an important thing to understand when we talk about nutrition. So why do we eat? And then the second part, uh, the majority of chapter three really is about digestion. So understanding the different organs of digestion um, and understanding in particular how our three different macronutrients are digested. So let's get started. Um, all righty, so let's start, as I said, with some of the psychological, um, physiological, and soci sociological reasons for why we eat. Uh, so first we'll start with some of the psychological reasons, right? Uh, sorry, physiological. Uh, <laughs> it's morning here as I'm making this recording, so bear with me <laughs> as my brain uh, gets with it. Okay, so physiological, meaning having to do with sort of the natural biochemical processes of the body. So this is a really important distinction to make. You see here I have hunger and I have appetite. And then you see that hunger, we, we list that as physiological, right? Physiological, so having to do with the inner workings of the body. Appetite you see, I, I note this as psychological, right? So having much more to do with the mind. So a really important distinction here. So hunger is a non-specific drive, or you could even say biological need for food, right? And again, food means calories and nutrients, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, phyto meaning plant, nutrients, again, meaning these elements, these components of food that are essential for human health. So phytonutrients are nutrients that come exclusively from plants. Um, again, we're gonna talk more about those in unit three. Um, so in order to, uh, yeah, so and as we talked about in chapter one, we need food, we need calories, and we need these different nutrients in order to maintain good health and proper functioning of the body. So hunger is defined as just this inner drive, this inner need to eat food. And we will talk quite a bit more about hunger, especially as it relates to the organs of digestion, like how our organs of digestion signal to our brain, hey, we are hungry, right? So the brain is, of course, involved in hunger because the brain has to recognize that there's this need for food. but the original identification of the need for food comes from our digestive organs. Whereas appetite, and I may as well change the color here, whereas appetite is pretty purely psychological, right? It's more of a, um, a cognitive or mental desire to consume a, usually, usually a specific type of food, right? So you might say, you know, man, I really want some ice cream right now, or I just am craving pizza. I just have such a hankering for pizza or French fries or whatever it is. Um, that's really your appetite talking, right? You don't, and and it's worth, you know, just again for kicks, for fun, worth checking in with your body when you have that desire for a specific type of food. You might also be hungry. You might not be hungry, right? Maybe you saw a commercial, or maybe you smelled that food, or maybe you heard somebody talking about getting ice cream, so now you can't stop thinking about it. Um, or you saw somebody eating ice cream, right? Or you walked by the pizza shop and saw them putting out fish pies. So appetite is often stimulated by these environmental cues, right? So something going on in our environment around us, and also our five senses. So again, seeing somebody else eating this food or again, seeing an advertisement or commercial, even hearing, right? If you hear somebody open a bag of chips and start crunching on them, you're like, ooh, I want some chips, right? Um, 
seeing, hearing, smelling, and honestly, a lot of <laughs> uh, food businesses, especially fast food restaurants, really use this. Um, I don't know if you can really call it marketing, <laughs> but they really they intentionally kind of pump their smell from their kitchens out into the roadways or into the sidewalks so that passers by smell that fast food and they're like, oh, I smell it, I want it, right? Um, and the other five senses, you can kind of go through that <laughs> yourself. Um, so then anorexia, we're going to talk more about anorexia again in unit four um, and some other kind of behaviorally related, um, I should say, I guess, dis disordered behaviors related to eating. So we'll definitely revisit anorexia then. Um, but it's, it's here just as kind of a counter to hunger and appetite. So when someone um, is kind of displaying anorexia, and this could either be due to, you know, sort of the, the mental health diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, or it could be the side effect of a medication. So anorexia is where we have this physiologic need for food, we might even have hunger, but there's no appetite to actually eat, right? So the appetite again could either, the lack of appetite could either be caused by maybe some mental health things going on, or that lack of appetite could again be the side effect of the medication. But underlying, there's still that need for food. There is actually still that hunger, but, but for some reason, right, depending on the cause, there's this sort of psychological overriding that's saying, well, I'm not going to eat or just, just don't feel like eating. So um, let's see. Coming back to hunger, maybe I'll switch back to yellow then. Um, as I said here, right, I said this is physiological, hunger is physiological, so kind of coming from the body, especially the digestive organs, but ultimately the brain is involved, right, so this, the organs of digestion have to somehow communicate up to the brain, um, and they do do that. I don't know if where it's listed. Maybe it's not listed in this um, text, and you don't necessarily need to know this, but there is at least one of the communication pathways is the vagus nerve, especially if you've studied, um, what do you call it, anatomy physiology. You might be familiar with the vagus nerve, so it connects the organs of digestion up to the brain, um, particularly to the hypothalamus, right, kind of this um, kind of message processing center of the brain. So the vagus nerve sends the messages from your stomach, your small intestine, up to your hypothalamus. And so the hypothalamus is the part of the brain that's integrating these nerve signals, nerve signals from the body and identifies it as hunger, or if you're not hungry, the opposite would be sati satiation or fullness. Right? So the hypothalamus, um, I said it's morning and I don't have all my own words. The hypothalamus processes, processes the messages from your digestive organs that travel along the vagus nerve and identifies either, okay, the stomach is empty, the small intestine is empty, the body must be hungry then, right? We need to fill those organs back up. Or the stomach is full, the small intestine is working, we don't need to eat anymore, right? We're satisfied. Um, right, and so then there is, yes, particularly the stomach and small intestine are the organs of digestion that are communicating these messages up to the hypothalamus. Here's your hypothalamus, <laughs> kind of just a little ways right behind your eye, right? Um, so some other signals for hunger are coming from hormones, right? So we get this sense of hunger, from, and this is what I mean by physiologic, right? When I say like of the body, um, in this slide, we're talking about the nervous system. And now we're talking about the endocrine system, right? So this is what hunger is. Hunger is triggered by the nervous system. Well, not triggered by, um, 
hunger is triggered by the organs of digestion and communicated through the nervous system and the endocrine system via nerve cells or neurons and via hormones. Um, and again, that message is ultimately being relayed up to the brain. Um, so how do some of these hormones help to regulate either hunger, the sensation of hunger or satiety? Um, and we will revisit these all in a little bit more depth. So we have two hormones that come from the pancreas. We have more than two that come from the pancreas, but two in this case. Um, insulin and glucagon also assist with this physiologic understanding of hunger and satiety. Insulin and glucagon, you might be familiar with the notion that they, or the, the understanding that they help to regulate blood glucose levels. So when glucagon is present, that means we probably have low blood glucose levels, right? I always like to think of, you know, the word is glucagon, which means the glucose is gone. So, I mean, not entirely, but <laughs> the blood glucose level is lower than homeostatic normal. Um, so that would be contributing to a sensation of hunger. On the opposite side, insulin is present after a meal and helps to distribute effectively the glucose that gets into our bloodstream from the intestines after the meal. So insulin is going to be present to signal, to help signal satiety. Um, ghrelin, we will revisit this shortly. This is a hormone produced by the stomach. Um, it signals hunger. And I always like to I give you my reminder here. So the word ghrelin, you might think of grr, your stomach rumbling. <laughs> so ghrelin helps to sig signal hunger. And then sort of the opposite is a hormone called cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin, take a second to process that one and, and say it out loud a few times. We do abbreviate it CCK because it is kind of a mouthful. But cholecystokinin acts opposite to ghrelin and helps to signal satiety. Um, also, CCK is produced by the small intestine. Um, we're going to see in just a minute the flow of food, I guess, through digestion is right the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, and then the small intestine and then the large intestine. Um, so by the time our like food has gotten to the small intestine, that's, that would be, again, an opportunity for both the nervous system and the endocrine system to say, oh, okay, the small intestine is full now of digestion. We don't need to eat anymore, right? So that's why CCK, cholecystokinin would say, oh, okay, small intestine is full. Let's turn off the hunger signals. And then there's one other um, hormone that helps with hunger cues, which is leptin or hunger satiety cues. Leptin, interesting, and interestingly, I think, is produced by our adipose cells, right, so our fat cells. And leptin's job is to suppress hunger and to sort of turn off hunger again to induce that sensation of satiety. This hopefully makes some logical sense, right? Because when we, or it, hopefully it will as the semester goes on, but when we eat food, right, ultimately, again, we're harnessing some of those uh, macronutrients. So we're harnessing the carbohydrate, we're harnessing the lipid, and we're harnessing the protein from the food. These are all calorie-containing nutrients. If we eat maybe just enough and a little more, we probably have calories, we probably took in extra calories, right? Fairly often, it's, you know, we might take in extra calories. And when we do eat extra calories at any given meal, our bodies aren't just going to say, oh, too many, let's get rid of them. Our bodies are going to say, oh, extra calories, let's store them. Leptin, I'm uh, sorry, adipose is one of the, well, it is the largest storage site of reserve calories, if you want to think of it that way. And so after a meal, if we've had enough calories such that we can now deposit some of that extra, you can kind of think of adipose as like your, savings, your bank savings account, right? Um, we've now deposited enough extra calories into adipose tissue. So the adipose is going to say, oh, okay, we are, we just ate so much, like we just ate enough food that we're actually putting extra into adipose. So 
let's definitely turn off any hunger signals that we might have. So that's the leptin's job. Um, something we won't get so into into this class is the notion that, um, or even the theory, if you want to call it that, that in folks who are so overweight as to be classified as obese, that leptin, their bodies actually don't respond so well to leptin, right? Which can be pretty problematic, right? Because leptin is part of that process of saying, I'm full, I'm satisfied, I don't need to eat anymore. Right? So it kind of makes for a little bit of a vicious cycle where you know, somebody might be eating and eating and eating and never getting that message that they've had enough. And then food itself can have a strong influence on feelings of hunger and satiety. Really, this should say, this should almost say satiety, not hunger. Um, so let's, let me just switch to highlighter mode. Oops, that's a pen. Yeah. So these components, right? Foods that are rich in fiber and water, foods that are complex or whole, right? Minimally processed, um, and solid foods. These are all going to promote a greater sense of satiety, right? Satiety, which basically means filling, right? Hopefully this will again make more sense as we go on and learn more about fiber and water, learn more about like complex carbohydrates, understand better the shape of proteins. Um, but effectively, and let me see, I do have it here. So this is, <laughs> it didn't cite this. Uh, this slide comes from a website called Forks Over Knives. Oops, let me go back to pen and get out of the yellow. So Forks Over Knives, which is um, a website that does promote a plant-based diet. So um, just take note of that. But it, if you're interested in a plant-based diet, it has lots of great resources and recipes, um, which you'll come to find out is <laughs> really healthy for you. But this is, a, I think, a really, really cool chart that just shows us the stomach, so each of these five slides is a rough drawing of the stomach. And what it's showing us is this concept of caloric density, which we could again call energy density, right? Calorie equals energy. And as we just, well, I didn't quite say it here, but this, what this first bullet is saying is that foods that have a lot of fiber and water distend the stomach which means they fill it up so much that it starts to like stretch the stomach, right? So the stomach, the walls of the stomach are like, stomach are like ooh, okay, filling up here. Um, I'll probably say this again when we talk more specifically about the stomach, but the stomach has this pretty, I think, awesome capacity to expand and also contract, depending on what's in it. So um, your stomach can get to as small as like a cup or three quarters of a cup. It can get really small if you haven't, you know, say you decide to fast for 24 hours or something. And on the other hand, your stomach can really stretch quite a bit, depending on the, per the person. The stomach could even descend to be about the size of a gallon. That's an enormous difference, right? A gallon to a cup. So as the stomach, as we eat, food goes pretty immediately into the stomach. And as we eat and eat and eat, the stomach starts to expand, expand, expand. And it is literally that expansion, which on the slide here is distension. It's the expansion of the stomach that causes that um, nervous signal along the vagus nerve up to the brain that says, whoa, I'm full, <laughs> stop eating, right? I think we've all experienced that before, right? I think we've also all experienced, uh, well, maybe, you know, I have far too many times where you've eaten enough, you've eaten way too much that you're like so uncomfortably full, right? That's where you've just piled way too much food in your stomach and your body's like, oh my God, what did you do, right? So that's again, just that expansion of the stomach. That's what this slide is showing us. And if we look over here, we've got potatoes, rice, and beans, fruits, and veggies. And uh, the title would indicate to us that each one of these frames is 500 calories worth of food. 500, 500, 500 calories, right? Units of energy. 
And what we're seeing here is that 500 calories basically of fruits and veggies and you know, maybe a little more than 500 calories of potatoes, rice, and beans fills the stomach all the way up, right? So we're going to get the most satiety and satisfaction per calorie, let me say it that way, from effectively plant foods. Complex or whole foods tend to be rich in protein, fat, and complex carbohydrates. These are also the most satisfying, right? Whereas processed and refined foods are not very satisfying. And on this chart, unfortunately, they don't give us a great example of processed food, but maybe we could use these two columns to approximate, like maybe this one is pizza, right? <laughs> a lot of cheese. And maybe this one is like chips, right? Chips have a lot of oil. So what we're seeing is 500 calories of chips you won't even feel it. Your stomach will not even register that you just ate anything. So you're gonna keep on eating because you haven't registered fullness. And let's see, I mean, this is a really rough approximation, right? This isn't exact, but let's say this amount of oil has filled, you know, like an eighth of the stomach. So say we had to eat eight times this much, right? That's, that would be 4,000 calories. You have to eat 4,000 calories just to feel full, right? And if we're eating, you know, two, three, four smaller meals throughout the day, well, if you're trying to eat all those meals of chips, you're going to end up taking in an exorbitant number of calories just to reach that feeling of satisfaction and fullness. Um, so uh, over here, I've got examples examples of other processed foods, and we will talk more about this throughout the semester, um, but we'll come to discover like flour-based foods, and it, which is a lot of the food in the United States, right? This is anything from bread to pancakes to bagels to muffins, um, even like tortilla wraps, um, crackers, all of our breakfast cereals, the vast majority of them anyway. Uh, what else do we eat? You know, the obvious things like cookies and pies and cakes and stuff. So flour-based foods are really processed for varying degrees of processing, for sure, varying degrees, right? Um, but a lot of them are heavily processed and heavily refined, which means they kind of get a little more dense, right? They're no longer made from these complex molecules, right? They've been processed, processed, processed. So they kind of just get dense, dense, dense which is equivalent to the oil or the cheese, right? Where now you're gonna pack a buttload of calories into a relatively small space, which means again, we can eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and never feel full or satisfied. Oh, I only give one example here. So whole wheat or white flour pancakes with maple syrup would be less satisfying than something like eggs with vegetables and a whole grain toast so yes, flour food here, but we'll talk more about this in chapter four when we talk about carbohydrates. Whole grain bread is going to be less processed, so still retain a little bit more of the complexity um, and a little bit more of the fiber than a refined or processed white flour pancake. Or perhaps an even more satisfying example would be rolled oats with nuts, seeds, and berries, you know, and maybe some milk. Um, or other fruit, like an apple even. So what you have here now is rolled oats have a lot of fiber, so do nuts, seeds, and fruit. These oats, the way we have to cook them, right, and fruit also contain a lot of water. And then collectively, this full meal has is a great source of protein, fat, and complex carbohydrate. So these, these two examples wind up being super satisfying and relatively few calories or um, a healthful amount of calories, I guess I could say. Then one other important thing in terms of hunger and satiety, or really satiety, is that solid foods inevitably are gonna be more filling and satisfying than semi-solid foods or liquids, right? So things like smoothies or like pudding type thing, um, juices or shakes, right, or, or any beverage that you drink that it has calories, so any soda or alcohol or juice even, those are going to be much more similar to the left side over here, right, 
where they've, con you know, any, any calorie containing beverage has effectively concentrated all those calories, simplified them all the way down, probably to sugar, right? Or if it is a smoothie, it's still basically, the blender basically did all the digestion for you. So now where you might've had, you know, if you were to eat all the veggies you put in the smoothie, you'd be full maybe before you get through half of them. I mean, maybe not, but just for a sake of example, but if you blend them all up, right, maybe it's more like meat, right? Where now you've got 500 calories in that smoothie, you drink it all down and you're like, oh, I could still eat, right? You still kind of have room because you compacted all that food. All right, let's move on. So um, why else do we eat? Uh, so again, these, this gets back to the psychology of eating, right? Uh, so appetite. I'm going to go to this slide because I think, again, I'm sorry I deleted which um, image this is from your text, but chapter three. Uh, so these are some of the psychological environmental influences for why we might eat, right? So this, these are all pertaining more to appetite, more so than they do to hunger. So again, our five senses, right? Just seeing someone eating, smelling the food, even tasting it, right? Like if you're preparing food for dinner or something, and maybe you're preparing it right after lunch, I don't know, and you're not really hungry, but you taste the food and you're like, oh, this is good, and you wanna eat more of it, right? Or you just ate dinner and you're making cookies, right? And you're not hungry, but you taste the cookie better and you're like, oh my God, right? Pleasure sensors light up from all the sugar. Um, texture too, right? And again, uh, processed food companies really nail this down, right? They get the texture just right that we're like, oh, I want to keep eating that, especially that crunchy stuff. Um, and again, sound, even just hearing, like hearing the people in the next aisle eating popcorn at the movie theater, you're like, oh, I should go get some popcorn. But you're not actually hungry. You're just experiencing it and you're like, oh, now I want it. Don't need it, want it. Um, and then some other like social and cultural cues for why we might eat again, not necessarily due to hunger, but just due to circumstance or environment. So certain occasions, right? Like summertime uh, or even holiday time in the winter, right? It's just like food, food, food everywhere. So maybe you go to a bunch of um, Fourth of July parties or you go to a bunch of holiday parties in the winter and you're like, oh, I just went to a party and I just ate, but now I'm at another party and there's more food, I'm gonna eat some more. Um, certain locations or activities, a lot of activities revolve around food. You know, again, maybe if you're like at the shopping mall or something, or even just walking down Market Street and you have no intention of eating, but then you walk by a bunch of restaurants and you're like, oh, let's stop and eat. Um, food is also very social, so we might eat with others. A lot of times too, people are eating just because it's a certain time of day. So they're like, oh, breakfast is at eight, lunch is at noon, dinner is at six. But if they actually check in, they might not be hungry at all of those times, right? Um, again, environmental sights and sounds um, and emotions for sure. I mean, we all probably relate to this one, right? Emotional eating. Um, and then some other learned factors or learned factors around um, when to eat or why to eat. Um, so again, family, right? Like you learn, most of us learn what to eat and how to eat from our family, whether it's healthy or not, right? Whether it respects hunger and satiety or doesn't. Same with our community, religion, certain culture, right? Certain cultures might influence what time we eat or what types of foods we eat or how much we eat. Okay, so I'll say here, I think that I'm gonna try to make this a one, one and done lecture. So this will probably be a long recording. So if you want to, this would probably be a good place to pause and just take a break and come back. Because um, now we're going to transition into that, talking about digestion. So um, when we eat, there are three processes for you to become familiar with. Digestion, absorption, and elimination, right? This is nutrition, right? This is the science of nutrition, digestion, absorption, elimination. Digestion, and it's also important that you understand, you know, how you might de define each of these independently. So digestion takes our large food molecules, like a bite of an apple, right, and breaks it down to smaller molecules, both through mechanical and chemical processes. 
absorption then takes those small molecules, which is called taking these products. <laughs> so these products are the smaller molecules. So it takes these smaller molecules and absorbs them through the intestinal wall. These smaller molecules are the nutrients that we just learned about last week. Carbohydrate, protein, um, yeah, carbohydrate, protein, lipid, vitamin, mineral, water. And then elimination is the process of getting rid of the waste, right? Taking the trash out. Um, elimination, I think, is maybe the under the unfortunately underlooked or overlooked part of nutrition. Um, elimination is a really important uh, process here. It should really we should really be eliminating at least every day, if not even three times a day, right? Because we should arguably be eliminating about as frequently as we eat, because we should be getting rid of the waste from what we ate. So elimination, this is passing a bowel movement or going poop. Um, this is getting rid of the undigested portions of food and, and also any other like metabolic waste products from the body that have circulated back um, to the liver and then gotten put into the intestines. These processes happen along the gastrointestinal tract. So maybe just familiarize yourself with that concept. Gastro, usually meaning stomach. Intestinal, meaning intestines. So as we'll come to see, we're going to name a few different organs of digestion, but the primary digestion is happening in the stomach and the intestines, including small and large intestine. Um, so gastrointestinal tract. We're also going to see a word gastrointestinal system. And maybe worth noting, too, that this GI system refers to the entire system, um, which does include some accessory organs, whereas the GI tract is referring to these primary organs of digestion. So the tract is this, the primary organs of digestion. So the organs through which food actually passes. So the mouth, the pharynx, doesn't have much digestive work, but the food passes through there in order to get to the esophagus. The esophagus is a long tube at the back of your neck, um, leading into the stomach, kind of just below your diaphragm, actually not too far below your heart, and then ultimately into the small intestine, kind of the center of your abdomen, and then the large intestine wraps around the abdomen and then goes back towards your rectum. Right, the end of the large intestine is the rectum. Um, we'll identify some of the sphincters along the way. These are just muscles that control the movement of food from one organ to the next. And the point there is that we want food to go in one direction, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why we don't just throw up every time we eat, because there are sphincters, especially at the bottom of the esophagus, um, the gastroesophageal sphincter, that prevents food from going from the stomach back into the esophagus. And same thing, there's another sphincter from the stomach to the, the first part of the small intestine that prevents the food from coming back into the stomach once it's passed into the intestine. And then the accessory organs of digestion, these are really critical. Um, and they're called accessory, again, because food doesn't pass directly through them. But they're critical for digestion. We can't really digest well without them. So these include the salivary glands of the mouth. And then the, the, real, the real kickers here are the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. As we'll come to see, especially the pancreas, well, all three of them really, but especially the liver and the pancreas produce a lot of enzymes and other, let's say, digestive substances that really facilitate the process of digestion. So without them, we're going to have a much harder time really doing great digestive work. Ooh, that's really fine print. So this is also from your text. Again, I'm sorry I took the figure number out. Um, so let's see. On the right, you see the accessory organs. And on the left, you see the actual organs of the digestive tract. So let's just go through these briefly. This would be a really good one to study and review. Um, I won't test you on knowing um, the layout of the organs, but again, 
this to just this is just information that pertains to your everyday life. So I, I can't you know, I can't see why it wouldn't be valuable to you know just come to familiarize yourself with it. This is your body. Your body looks pretty much just like this. So the organs of the digestive tract, right? Again, only the tract that through which food passes. Actually, it says it right up here. The gastrointestinal system consists of the organs of the GI tract and the organs that we call accessory organs. So this, um, actually, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and retitle that. This is actually GI system. Oops, is what this slide is showing us. Okay, so let's look at the GI tract organs. So again, it's the mouth, right? I think we all know where the mouth is. Then there's the pharynx, is kind of this top part up here. Um, and then the esophagus. So again, you can just trace this on your own body, right? Mouth, pharynx, esophagus. Here's your stomach. Again, kind of on the left side of your body, right? Remember, we're looking at this person face on. So stomach's over here on the left side, like, like tucked in kind of behind a rib cage, sort of just below the heart, just below the diaphragm. Um, so there's the stomach, and then the stomach passes into the duodenum of the small intestine, and then this whole coily stuff is the small intestine. And then the small intestine over here on the bottom right side of your abdomen is where the small intestine connects to the large intestine. And then the large intestine comes up. And again, just go ahead and trace it on your own body, right? Large intestine comes up. There are basically three parts of the large intestine. Ascending colon, we call it, ascending colon. Transverse comes across your abdomen. Oh, sorry. And then descending colon goes down the left side of your abdomen. And again, then kind of goes back towards the back side of your body and ultimately to the rectum, which is where you pass a, a bowel movement. And then the accessory organs. So we have the salivary glands of the mouth. There are a few different salivary glands. You don't need to know them for this class. Um, the liver, so this is your liver here. Again, kind of sits up here on the right side of your abdomen. The gallbladder is kind of tucked in right behind the liver. And then the pancreas is kind of right in the center. Um, actually, I actually don't know if it's deeper to the stomach. Uh, or if it's more superficial. But the pancreas is kind of right up there, tucked right next to your stomach, um, and feeds into the small intestine primarily. It feeds its juices into the small intestine. Okay, so we will go through all these organs um, in great detail. So let's talk a little bit about some of the structure, like just the overall structure of these organs. So the GI tract is a series of organs that work together to process the foods, and it's arranged basically in a long tube, right? So you can basically think of the stomach to the small intestine to the large intestine all the way to your rectum as one long tube. And you may be heard this somewhere along the way that if you were to stretch that tube out, or maybe you've had the opportunity to do a biology dissection, that full tube is almost 30 feet, right? It's a long, 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 long ways. And it's all just coiled up in here. But that's how we digest our food. It's in that giant tube. Um, so there are four layers of this tube. Uh, this is helpful, you know, especially if you do kind of go into medicine or nursing. It's also important in nutrition for sure. Um, but just, or especially if you go into dietetics. Um, but otherwise, we won't focus too intensely on it. So the mucosa is the innermost layer that surrounds the open space, right? So it's just the innermost layer of the tube. And that hopefully would make some sense, like mucosa, mucus, right? There's gonna be probably pretty mucusy in there, right? We're doing a lot of digestion. You know, if you've ever even just noticed your own saliva, right? It's pretty mucusy. Um, or if you've had the unpleasant experience of throwing up, it's pretty mucusy, right? So mucosa is the innermost layer. Then there's the submucosa, like just behind the mucosa layer. And that's where we have a lot of the connective tissue, and that's where the nerves come in, right? So connective tissue, right, kind of helping to connect it to the other parts of the body um, and allowing for it to be kind of a supple tube, right? Not a um, firm, rigid tube, right? 
And then behind the mucosa, we have the muscularis externa. And the mus so this is the muscle layer. And you'll come to see, well, here's the example, I guess. Here's the muscularis externa. And you can see, if you're familiar with what muscle tissue look like, looks like, you can see all those striations of the muscle tissue. Um, and we'll come to learn a lot of, we talked to, briefly, I mentioned that digestion happens through mechanical and chemical processes. So the mechanical processes are muscle, muscular processes, right? Muscle is mechanics, right? So the stomach, the intestines, they have this muscular layer around them that are expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting to help move food along and also in some ways to help mix food. So there are two different types of muscle. There's circular muscle, which is the one that kind of squeezes, kind of squeezes and mixes, kind of like, I don't know if you're making a kale salad, right? And you're kind of like squeezing everything around with your hands. Um, or if you're kneading bread, right? You're kind of like mixing it all together. And then the longitudinal muscle um, does more of like propelling food along. So particularly, um, one, I think I think the best example of this is the large intestine, right? So again, that ascending colon, you know, make food move against gravity there, right? So you actually have these longitudinal muscles that kind of squeeze up, squeeze the food up and then across and then back down. And then the serosa is just the outermost layer of the muscle or of the organ. So the lumen, right, is the interior open space. Then you have the mucosal layer, which is that inner layer, then submucosa where the nerve endings come in, muscularis externa, and then serosa. Okay, so now we're gonna go through each organ. <laughs> so digestion begins in the mouth. Um, and technically cephalic phase of digestion is like that very first phase of digestion. Cephalic, right, maybe you think of head when you think of cephalic. So this, the cephalic phase of digestion is where the appetite and hunger actually start, actually begin the processes of digestion. So if you start to have an appetite for pizza or ice cream, or you, you start to recognize, wow, I'm really hungry, your brain already is going to then send signals back down to your digestive organs to say, okay, we're gonna go eat something, get ready to digest it, right? So the first thought of food stimulates the release of digestive juices from our digestive organs. And that again is happening through communication along the nervous system, sending that signal right back down the vagus nerve. Um, in the mouth, so what, then once we begin, again, the kind of mechanical and physical processes of digestion, we'll start with chewing, right? So once we finally eat something, we'll start chewing it. And chewing itself is a mechanical process, but we're gonna see too that as we're chewing, we're secreting saliva, and saliva is gonna help to promote from the chemical process of digestion. I didn't say that here, so I would add that to your notes, right? Saliva assists in chemical digestion. So saliva contains digestive juices secreted by those salivary glands, which are accessory organs. Um, also in the mouth, we have taste receptors and olfactory receptors. Um, so we can detect the five distinct tastes and the smell of food. So here's what is what saliva is made of, right? So chemical process. So saliva contains four key parts, enzymes, bicarbonate, mucus, and antibodies, right? So enzymes, were, you might be familiar with the term enzymes, maybe from other biology classes, right? But enzymes are actually proteins. So again, this is one of the examples of where protein in the body is functional. It's not a source of calories, right? So enzymes are proteins that um, induce chemical changes, right? They kind of speed up a reaction. That's, that's how I always recall it from, from my high school biology, right? So there's all sorts of reactions always happening in the body. Enzymes help move those reactions along a little more rapidly. Um, so we have salivary enzymes that help to break down some of our food, specifically starches. So we have a type of salivary enzyme called salivary amylase that acts 
specifically on starch. Okay, we'll come to learn this term amyl is actually referring to carbohydrate. And then you might be familiar with this ending, this suffix ASE. Wherever you see ASE, that's relating to an enzyme. That's usually naming an enzyme. And then the first part of the name of the enzyme is referring to this, the thing on which it works. So a, a meal, we're going to learn amylopectin and amylose are two types of starches. So a meal, meaning starch, ACE meaning enzyme, so amylase is an enzyme that digests starches. Right? So it's the way the naming works, right? It's the enzyme that works on the thing that's being named. Alrighty, and then bicarbonate it neutralizes acids. If you're familiar with like acids and bases, um, bicarbonate is something that's just gonna, bicarbonate is more basic, so it's gonna neutralize anything that's acidic in the food. Mucus, again, helps to just moisten the food, moisten the oral cavity so that you can kind of do that nice digestion. And then our saliva also contains antibodies and lysozymes, which are two, again, protein molecules that help to fight off any kind of foreign particles, especially of, especially of bacteria um, that might have come in through the food or even through the air or the water that you're drinking. So right away, right, that's kind of first line of defense is the antibodies and the lysozymes in your saliva. Um, so as we chew the food, um, if you've ever, and this is kind of a gross example, but if you've ever been eating, right, and you're chewing, 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 and suddenly something makes you sneeze or laugh or guffaw and you spit all the food out of your mouth, it's not really recognizable as what it went in as, right? Not so much. So well, you'll see as we talk through all of digestion, we start to use different words to refer to the different um, phases, I guess, of digestion. So as we're chewing, 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 and then ultimately swallowing the food, we're actually going to start to call that a bolus now. We're not really going to call it food anymore because it's like food that's been digested, digested a little bit. So what we swallow is a bolus. The bolus goes down the epiglottis. Oh, sorry, the bolus goes down the esophagus, and there's a little flap that covers the esophagus, which is called the epiglottis, right? So the epiglottis is actually often covering the esophagus if we're not eating, and that allows air to go into the trachea and ultimately into the lungs. So when we are eating, the epiglottis is going to flip and cover the trachea so that the food goes down the esophagus. And so the epiglottis can kind of flip back and forth and cover whichever one needs to be covered. And then I mentioned earlier that there, those longitudinal muscles help to um, contract and move food through the GI tract. So peristalsis is the action of those muscles. So peristalsis refers to muscular contractions that propel food through the GI tract. So we're going to see that the large intestine those muscles do peristalsis, and also the esophagus, the muscles of the esophagus do peristalsis to move that food down. Um, it's just a helpful review slide. I'm not gonna spend too much time here though, uh, except maybe other, other than to highlight the trachea, right? So the trachea is usually more superficial, meaning front of body, and the, the esophagus is usually right behind the trachea. Um, you can even kind of feel it, even when you just swallow. You can feel like behind your trachea, you can feel those muscles moving. And then, so here's the epiglottis, which is the flap, right, that covers, usually covers, or can cover the um, esophagus, right? But in this case, when we're, when we're eating food, it's going to cover the trachea to make sure that we're not swallowing food into the trachea. And then here's one of the first sphincters, is the upper esophageal sphincter. Um, so that also helps make sure that when we're not eating, we're not sending anything down into the esophagus.
Um, let me also point out, so salivary amylase begins the breakdown of carbohydrate, starch is carbohydrate, and then lingual lipase is another enzyme, lingual meaning tongue lipase, so LIP, you can think of LIP, lipid, and again, ACE meaning enzyme, so breaking down and breaking down lipids. Chewing and swallowing, again, uh, so when we're chewing, the epiglottis is open, the esophagus is closed, right? So the sphincter is closing the esophagus. And then when we swallow the epiglottis, so I think I, I shouldn't have said earlier that the epiglottis covers the trachea. Sorry, it does cover the trachea. It doesn't so much cover the esophagus. It's really the sphincter, the esophageal sphincter that keeps things from going down the esophagus until we're ready to swallow. So when we swallow, again, the epiglottis closes the trachea and the esophagus opens, that sphincter opens up. And so here you can see the green bolus is going down and it's gonna go down the esophagus, not the trachea. Here's the action of peristalsis in the esophagus, right? So these muscular contractions that just kind of pinch the food down. No actual digestion is occurring in the esophagus. It's part of the tract because it passes through, but nothing's actually being digested there. It's just getting it from the mouth to the stomach. All righty, so now we can talk about the stomach. So in the stomach, there's a lot of hormones. Uh, there's a few hormones going on. Gastrin is one of them. Uh, also, start to write, think of this word gastro, gastric, gastrin, gast, gastra is referring to the stomach. So gastrin is a hormone that's secreted by the stomach that stimulates the release of gastric juices. Again, gastric meaning stomach, so juices of the stomach that are going to do digestion. So gastric juice contains hydrochloric acid. So just like salivary and uh, just like saliva, salivary juices, this is gastric juices. So what's in these juices? Hydrochloric acid, pepsin, gastric lipase, and intrinsic factor. These are all in the stomach, secreted at the invitation of gastrin. So when, um, actually, even if we just go back, way back, the cephalic phase, right? So the first thought of food, stimulates the release of digestive juices. So that's actually, in part, these gastric juices, right? So even in that cephalic phase, that, that phase when we're just thinking about food, that's already, the brain's already gonna send that message down the vagus nerve to the stomach that says, hey stomach, secrete your gastrin, and the gastrin will then act right back on the stomach to signal those cells to release gastric juice. So gastric juice contains hydrochloric acid. Um, hydrochloric acid is an important one to know. It does something that we call denatures, but denatures proteins, which means it changes their shape, basically. And by changing their shape, it makes them no longer functional. That's relatively important because when we eat food, we're eating a lot of proteins that are functional for other things. Right? So we're eating proteins that are functional for a potato <laughs> or eating proteins that are functional for a cow or proteins that might be functional for a chicken. Right? We don't per se want their proteins to be functioning in our bodies. So it's really pretty critical that we kind of nip them in the bud right there, denature them right away so that they can't function in our bodies. Um, and then we will further digest them from there. Hydrochloric acid also activates this enzyme pepsin. So it has an inactive form, which is pepsinogen, and then it gets activated to its active form, pepsin. So here we see pepsin. Pepsin's job, again, it's an enzyme. So its job is to start to break down or, or facilitate the breakdown of protein. So pep, just like like, think of pep for peptide for protein. That'll make more sense when we learn more about proteins. And then gastric lipase, so gastric meaning of the stomach, lipase meaning lipid, and ACE meaning enzyme. So this is an enzyme that digests fats that's produced in the stomach. 
And then we have intrinsic factor. We'll learn more about intrinsic factor when we talk more about vitamin B12, but intrinsic factor is, is critical to actually absorbing B12 in the intestines. So this is another really important function of the stomach is the production of intrinsic factor. Um, I guess your book talks about pH here, maybe because of the hydrochloric acid. So just a little review of pH. Remember pH is an abbreviation that stands for potential of hydrogen. And it's basically a measure of how acidic or basic, alkaline or basic, those are kind of synonyms. So how acidic or basic a solution or a compound is. And basic, <laughs> basically, effectively, this measurement is, is indicating how well that compound can either take up or like, um, you know, add to its collection a hydrogen atom or ion, or how well that substance is going to give away or donate hydrogen. So its ability to release or take up hydrogen. Um, pure water is pretty neutral. It's neither acidic nor basic. Um, so is blood. Tissues that line the stomach are generally protected from the, from the acidity of hydrochloric acid, because as we'll see, hydrochloric acid is very acidic, um, but most, most of our bodies are fairly neutral. So because of all that acidity of the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, those cells that line the stomach have to be protected a bit from that acidity. And we'll see they are by mucus, basically. So here's the pH scale. Um, so here's hydrochloric acid, right? pH of one, not far off from battery acid. <laughs> and you'll see other things like lemon juice, gastric juice itself is a pH of two. A pure neutral pH is of usually around seven, with pure water. Um, you'll see urine is slightly more acidic than that. Why don't they put blood in here? So blood is just above pH of seven, right? Um, pancreatic juice is slightly more alkaline. And then you can go on and on and on and up. Um, bleach, right? Very basic concentrated lye, perhaps the most basic. Okay, so digestion in the stomach. So chyme, this is what the bolus becomes, right? So the bolus is after we've digested in the mouth, we swallow it down the esophagus and it enters the stomach, then the stomach does all of its digestion, and now we start to call that chyme. So chyme is the liquid product of mechanical and chemical digestion in the stomach. So chyme is what will ultimately pass from the stomach to the small intestine. As I roughly briefly mentioned on the last slide, there is a mucus layer, um, kind of superficial to the mucosa, that protects those cells that line the stomach from the hydrochloric acid. And then there is also bicarbonate in that mucus layer that helps to neutralize the acid near these um, cells that line the stomach. So the bicarbonate is part of that mucus layer. So here are the mucus surface cells. Remember we said that that first layer of, these di of the digestive tract is called the mucosa. So these mucosal surface cells actually secrete mucus droplets and bicarbonate, which forms then this mucus layer that sits right in front of, or you can think of maybe on top of these surface cells, protecting them from the rest of the chyme, which is super acidic due to the gastric juice acidity. Ooh, moving on to the small intestine. So again, that chyme is gonna pass from the stomach to the small intestine. Um, the small intestine has three parts in, in order, in chronological order. So the duodenum is the part of the stomach, is the part of the small intestine that receives the chyme from the stomach. So it's the, we call it the first part of the small intestine. The jejunum is kind of the major part of the small intestine. And then the ileum connects to the colon, right, connects to the large intestine. So there's another valve, uh, another sphincter um, from the ileum to the colon, which is the ileocecal valve. 
Um, this is really important. Most digestion and absorption occurs in the small intestine. That's a pretty common test question, right? And it's just a really um, common thing to know if you continue in the medical field in any capacity. Most of our digestion and absorption happens in the small intestine. Um, so here's where the stomach connects to the duodenum. Here's the duodenum. Sometimes people call that duodenum. <laughs> you can say whatever you like. Um, you'll see also the gallbladder and the pancreas. You see these arrows. They are secreting their juices right into the duodenum. So remember the gallbladder and the pancreas are two of our accessory organs. And I said earlier that they are critical for digestion because they have a lot of juice and a lot of enzymes that facilitate digestion primarily in the small intestine. So they're going to be unloading all their juices into the duodenum at the same time that the stomach is delivering the chyme. So the gallbladder is releasing bile, which does something that we call emulsification of fats. So emulsification is this process of somewhat similar to, <laughs> this maybe is a bad example, but somewhat similar to like when you make salad dressing, right? You put oil and vinegar. Oil and water don't mix. That's the same with our bodies. Fats are oily or lipid. Our bodies are more water-based. They don't really mix. So emulsifying is what you would do if you like make a salad dressing and then you shake it up, right? You're trying to make the water and the fat mix together. So bile sort of does that, but then also is able to separate out little clumps of fat. So it's like separating clumps of fat into smaller pieces so that then our fat enzymes, fat digesting enzymes can actually kind of work on those little smaller globlets, goblets of fat. That's bile's job. Bile, we'll see, is produced by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, secreted by the gallbladder into the small intestine. There's also pancreatic lipase, so again, pancreatic meaning of the pancreas, coming from the pancreas, digesting fats. Also pancreatic amylase, again, coming from the pancreas, digesting starch or carbohydrate. There are also proteases. So <laughs> I said earlier, remember PEP for peptide for protein. Also just remember if it starts with P-R-O-T-E, protein, <laughs> protein. So proteases, digest proteins. Um, and then there's also bicarbonate secreted by the pancreas. So remember bicarbonate is, is basic. So, and remember chyme is gonna be really acidic because it just had that hydrochloric acid mixed into it. So right away, the um, pancreas is also gonna secrete some bicarbonate to neutralize the chyme that comes in. I, I'm not sure why, um, yeah, this PowerPoint is pretty brief on the small intestine, but there's so much happening in the small intestine. So please do read the section in the chapter about small intestine digestion and absorption. Um, we, there are some more slides coming up where we'll review a lot of what we just talked about, but definitely read through, I mean, read through all parts of the textbook, but particularly um, on the small intestine. Okay, so the large intestine, also known as the colon, that's why I said ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. Primary functions of the large intestine, water absorption, short chain fatty acid absorption, um, and electrolyte absorption. There's a little bit of digestion that still happens in the large intestine, but again, remember we just said the small intestine does most of digestion and absorption. So what, what's left then, right? So the large intestine primarily then collects undigested food materials and processes them into poop or stool or feces, and then eliminates them out of the rectum. So these are kind of the two primary functions. There's a little bit of absorption that happens, and then really the large intestine is for stool formation, which again is absolutely critical because it's sort of like taking the trash out, right? Just imagine your home, Imagine you never took your trash out. Ah, that would be really uncomfortable <laughs> pretty quickly. So large intestine is very important. There's this other really cool thing happening in the large intestine, which is this symbiotic relationship between you 
and bacteria. <laughs> so you maybe by now heard of the concept of the gut microbiome um, or like microflora of the gut. So maybe at this point, not so new in terms of like a frontier of medicine or science or nutrition, but relatively new in the grand scheme of things. So what, we've, what we do know, right, is that there are all sorts of microorganisms that live all over us, all over our skin, definitely in the mucous parts of our bodies. So in the mouth, in our eyes, um, in our reproductive areas, and all through the digestive system. So when we talk about gut microbiome, when we talk about like human microbiome, we're talking about all of those microorganisms. When we say specifically gut microbiome, we're referring specifically to the digestive organs. Um, and most specifically to the large intestine. So that's why it's here. So what we think we know so far <laughs> is that there are roughly, I've heard often more so the 50 trillion bacterial cells and again, other microorganisms that literally live in the large intestine and are beneficial to humans. That's why I said symbiotic. If you remember that term from basic biology, symbiosis means two things working together in harmony, right? They both benefit from the situation. So here is a short list, short list of some of the ways that these bacteria benefit us. They help to digest some of those remaining food particles and release some nutrients that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to get. Really importantly, they ferment fiber. And in doing so, they actually produce vitamins and these other molecules that we call short chain fatty acids that we then absorb and utilize for energy and even for communicating through the body. These bacteria stimulate our immune system. And again, the symbiotic bacteria, the beneficial bacteria are really important because when they are populous and healthful, it's survival of the fittest. They literally inhibit the growth of harmful microorganisms, which are just other types of bacteria or viruses or yeasts or fungi even that could cause problem, right? Or could cause disease or dishealth. Um, I think a really Quick, simple examples, like we have a strain of E. coli that naturally lives in our gut. And normally it lives there in a really small concentration. And part of what keeps the population so low is these other beneficial microorganisms that just sort of take up the space and use up the resources and keep their populations high. Having a healthy gut microbiome also reduces risk for diarrhea. Um, so where do we get these guys? <laughs> uh, really from birth, actually, and particularly, particularly from the birth canal, um, and then also from breastfeeding. So those are two critical functions of, um, again, delivery and breastfeeding, if possible. Not always possible, right? But um, best case scenario, if the, if the child can be born vaginally, it literally gets doused with bacteria as it passes through the vaginal canal. So its whole little body gets covered with these bacteria, And then through the breast milk, the mom can start passing on more microbes that then go immediately into the intestines and start to colonize. So really right from birth, we start to cultivate the gut microbiome. You might have also heard the concept of a probiotic. So probiotic is a pill. It's a supplement, right, that you can swallow that contains some of these microorganisms. Um, differing opinions, I guess, on the utility of probiotics. Um, certainly, I think they have a lot of utility as kind of a treatment, not necessarily a lifelong behavior. Right? But if somebody is dealing with really intense gut disease, right, or we sometimes say gut dysbiosis, right, so a dysfunctioning of the biome, um, probiotics can be part of the treatment but also the person would need to address their diet, other aspects of their lifestyle, like sleep and stress and exercise, um, and ultimately work on all of those factors to really bring about a sustainable, healthy gut microbiome. If we only take probiotics as a supplement and we don't change anything about our diets, 
we're literally just going to poop those guys out. So it can be an exorbitant waste of money if we're not also changing some of the lifestyle factors. Large intestine, so again, uh, so the cecum, that's why the ileocecal valve connects the small intestine to the cecum. Uh, so the cecum is kind of that first part of the large intestine, again, down here, the bottom right side of your abdomen. So the cecum receives everything from the small intestine, travels up, so it's ascending colon, across is transverse, and then down the left side of your body is the descending colon. The last little section, again, going back deeper into your um, lower abdomen, pelvis area, is the sigmoid colon, which feeds into the rectum and ultimately the anus, right? And that's where you pass a bowel movement. Okay, so enzymes. Enzymes, again, speed up digestion through hydrolysis, which is a, a reaction that breaks substances, substances apart by addition of water. So look at that word, hydro. What do you think of when you think of hydro? Hopefully by now you think of water. And lysis might be a newish term, but lysis literally means to break apart. So hydro means water, lysis means break apart. So we break something apart by spewing a bunch of water onto it. So that's one of the ways that enzymes work to speed up digestion. Um, maybe I didn't really say this so exactly, but enzymes are very specific. So remember we said, we talked about pepsin, we talked about salivary amylase, we talked about lingual lipase, we talked about um, pancreatic amylase, pancreatic lipase, we talked about proteases. Remember they're named for the substrate on which they work. So you can, we can't use lipase to break apart protein. You can't use lipase to break apart carbohydrate. Each enzyme is very specific to its substrate. Here's an overview of all the digestive enzymes, table 3.1. Um, I'll leave this for you to review. We've kind of talked about all of these. The only ones we haven't so much would be like some of these, some of these specific proteases, but note that there are three different proteases. I didn't mention elastase or cholesterol esterase, and I didn't mention carboxypeptidase, aminopeptidase, or dipeptidases. But what you'll see there, peptide, again, this is referring to protein, so they're digesting proteins. And then sucrase, maltase, and lactase, we are going to revisit these in the next chapter. These are enzymes that are digesting the simplest. Uh, the almost simplest, the second most simplest um, sugars. And they're going to break them down into the simplest sugars. Okay, so a little review of some of the hormones. We've talked about almost all of these, but there are more than 80 hormones that are involved in GI regulation. That's a ton, right? Uh, so we'll highlight five, and I think I've got them here. So what I want you to pay attention to is all of this. <laughs> Let's give this one a star. But notice, just a quick rundown here. All these five hormones, they're either produced in the stomach or the small intestine. Except for the last one, which is also produced by the pancreas. So that's easy, right? We only have to refer these back to two organs, the stomach and the small intestine, which, are where, which is where the bulk of digestion occurs. So hopefully that's easy to remember. And then the, yeah. And then the target organ, so if you, recall, if you recall, I didn't say this, but if you recall this from other bio classes, the endocrine system and hormones are the functional units of the endocrine system. The endocrine system works by one organ, so the production organ, releasing a hormone, and then the hormone travels through the blood and acts on another organ. That's how hormones work, usually. So usually the target organ will be different from the production organ. Um, gastrin, though, we said this earlier, gastrin is produced by the stomach and acts on the stomach. But these other ones, so small intestine, uh, secretin produced by small intestine acts on the pancreas and the stomach. CCK produced by small intestine acts on pancreas, gallbladder, stomach. GIP, gastric inhibitory peptide, produced by small intestine acts on stomach, pancreas. And so on and so forth. So pay attention to production and target organ. 
but also um, see what you can do to try to understand the words, right? Remember gastrin, so that's all about the stomach. And that was like that first hormone of digestion, right? It was even stimulated by the brain, right? By that cephalic phase of digestion. So it's going to stimulate digestion. Secretin is similar, right? So produced by the small intestine, stimulates the secretion. So secretin is probably about secreting the pancreatic bicarbonate. Um, and it acts on the stomach. So also think about this. Remember, the whole process of digestion is sequential. So once we're talking about small intestine hormones, start thinking, okay, well, there has to be a message then that goes back to the stomach that says, stop working, right? Because we're, we're done. We're passing food down to the small intestine and the large intestine. So secretin, while it's producing secretions in the, or stimulating secretions in the small intestine, it's also going to act back on the stomach to turn the stomach off, so to decrease gastric motility. Cholecystokinin, same, pretty similar functions, right? So it's stimulating the secretion of pancreatic digestive enzymes, stimulating the gallbladder to contract and release bile, and again, slowing gastric emptying. So secretin and CCK are very digestive, right? Um, remember, CCK was also somewhat, um, was also playing a role in satiety, right? So again, it's part of that digestive process. And then gastric inhibitory peptide, look at it, it's got the name right, it's got the function right in the name. It's going to inhibit the stomach, right? So it inhibits gastric juice secretion, further slows gastric emptying, and then acts on the pancreas to release insulin. And then somatostatin, so this is another one where you can kind of dissect the word a little bit. So somato, or soma, refers to the body, and statin is kind of like stop, right? So statin, like um, any of the statin drugs for cholesterol lowering, they're literally stopping our bodies from producing cholesterol. So somatostatin, so this is like stopping on the body, right? So produced by this, all of them, the stomach, the small intestine, and the pancreas, acting on the stomach, the small intestine, and the pancreas. And you'll see, basically, somatostatin is basically turning off digestion. So just do a little review there um, and see what, see what little tricks you might be able to come up with to help kind of make sense of the words, the hormones, and um, what their function is. Okay, now we'll talk about the three accessory organs. I don't think we're gonna highlight too much the salivary glands. So gallbladder, remember the gallbladder is tucked right under the liver. So it stores bile, which is that um, fluid that emulsifies the lipids. So it basically breaks lipids down into these smaller glo globules that can then be better accessed by the digestive, the lipid digesting enzymes. And remember CCK is the message from the small intestine that signals the gallbladder to release bile. Also remember that it's the liver that actually produces bile. All right, the pancreas, this is a major accessory organ. So it secretes, it makes, stores, and secretes all of the, well, most of the digestive enzymes. Um, it stores them in an active, in an inactive form. Um, so that once they're released into the small intestine, they can then become active there, right? Because we don't want the digestive enzymes working in the place where they're stored, right? Um, it would be, I don't know chemistry well enough, right? But it'd be like, you know, if you had a chemistry lab or even just a lot of like home, things we have at home, right? Like different solutions and stuff or cleaning agents. It's like, you don't want those cleaning agents just acting willy nilly in the closet where you're storing them. You want them to be inactive until you apply them to the thing you're cleaning or, or working on, right? So it's the same thing. We store them inactively and then they become activated once in the small intestine. The pancreas also secretes insulin and glucagon. We'll talk more about these in chapter four. Again, they regulate blood glucose. 
And again, the pancreas secretes the bicarbonate to neutralize the acidity of the chyme, because remember the stomach produced that hydrochloric acid. And then the liver, so certainly one of the most important organs in the whole body, not just for digestion. Um, we said, again, it produces bile to emulsify the fats. Again, bile is stored in that little gallbladder. Um, liver also can synthesize, so build, chemicals for metabolism. We'll talk more about that uh, in Chapter 7. The liver, this is an important, so the liver kind of has two separate functions in digestion. The liver makes bile, which is secreted then into the small intestine by way of the gallbladder. But then the liver also receives all the end products of digestion via the portal vein. So once everything gets absorbed from the small intestine, it actually travels to the liver. And then the liver is kind of like the director and says, okay, you go here, you go here, you go here. Right, and sends stuff back out to the body where it's needed. Um, glucose, the liver can also store glucose in the form of glycogen. So glycogen is one of our two forms of calorie storage. The other is adipose. We will talk more about that. The liver can also store vitamin, uh, vitamins. <laughs> and the liver also helps to make some of our blood proteins. Um, one last little overview of the GI tract and really the whole system. And this picture in particular wants to point out the hepatic portal vein. And so you'll see the hepatic portal vein is attached. I mean, it's not showing the small intestine in great detail, but the hepatic portal vein is kind of greatly intertwined with the small intestine so that it's absorbing all those nutrients of digestion from the small intestine and bringing them back up to the liver, again, to be passed back out to the rest of the body. Okay, so remember digestion was phase one, was part of this process of how we deal with food. Absorption is the second step. So absorption is where we take the molecules into the cells that line the small intestine and then into that hepatic portal vein. So the molecules come across the cell membrane and literally enter the cells of our bodies, specifically the small intestine. There's a little bit of absorption happening in the stomach and the large intestine, but most of it is in the small intestine. So usually when we talk about absorption and when we break it down into these little cellular and subcellular components, we're talking about the small intestine. Remember there's the mucosa, those are the cells that line the small intestine. Um, and we can also talk about, and then similar to the stomach, when we said that there's that mucous membrane, right, that protects the mucosal cells from the hydrochloric acid, same thing in the stomach. There's going to be this mucosal membrane that's right in front of these absorptive cells. So they have special structures that help to facilitate absorption in the mucous membrane. In there are these well, kind of in there, this kind of all goes together. There's a picture coming up, but villi is this term referring to folds in the lining of the GI tract. So these kind of like deep grooves. And basically the villi help because like food particles can kind of go in these grooves and then it's much easier for the cells to absorb those nutrients. Um, the cells that we're talking about are enterocytes. Enterocytes are the absorptive cells that are like in these deep grooved pockets in these villi. Um, there's also something called the brush border, which is kind of like the surface of these enterocytes, which is composed of microvilli. So microvilli, so tiny folds, right? Remember micro meaning small. So these tiny little folds right on the surface of these enterocytes which function to really increase the surface area, meaning there's greater space across which to absorb all these different nutrients. And then we'll see that um, uh, yeah, okay, so the villi are making like these folds, right? So some of those folds are going to be pockets of the intestine, but then the other part of the fold, 
is going to be that that like um, extra space outside of the small intestine. So it's in those extra, it's in those opposite folds that are created by the villi that we have um, blood vessel and lymph system kind of terminal ends, so capillaries and lacteals. And so once we absorb into the um, enterocytes, then it's a pretty quick passage out the other side to enter the capillary or the lacteal, which is the blood system and the lymph. <clears throat> Don't have a better picture than this one. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so here's here's what I was just talking about, the villi. Right, so um, this is kind of like the inside of your intestine. And then you have like this fold is what we call a villi. But then you see it creates these deep grooves, right? That's what I mean by like one part of the villi is making this groove. And it's in this groove that we're going to do a lot of absorption. But then it, the other part of the villi is this space that is extra or outside, like actually outside of the small intestine. This, these parts are outside of the small intestine, right? And this, the red part is referring to the capillaries of the blood, of the cardiovascular system of the blood. And then the, um, now I can't quite tell, the blue, let's call it, is the lacteal, so the lymph. Well, actually the green, sorry, the red and the blue are your capillaries. The green is the lymph. Um, and then this is highlighting the enterocyte right here, which is the absorptive cell, right? So again, you've got these villi, which are making these deep grooves, and then lining the, lining the mucosal side, so the inside of the small intestine, you have the enterocytes, the absorptive cells. And then this is taking an even up close look at those enterocytes. And so here are the enterocytes themselves, the absorptive cells, with that brush border surface, right? All those microvilli. So again, microvilli, this is a smaller version, making these same kind of deep, deep grooves. Again, the purpose is to just increase the surface area and facilitate greater absorption. So then again, you see these enterocytes, so they're going to absorb the end products of digestion and then pretty quickly and easily pass them right into either the capillaries or the lacteals. Um, absorption can happen a few different ways, right? Absorption can either require energy or it can happen with no energy, meaning caloric, like use of calories. So two types of absorption that happen without caloric expenditure, passive diffusion and facilitated diffusion. You might recall diffusion from other bio classes. Diffusion just means along a concentration, um, along a concentration gradient. So moving from an area of high concentration to low. That would make sense, right? After a meal, there's gonna be higher concentration of nutrients in the small intestine relative to the enterocytes. So a lot of nutrients are really just going to flow pretty simply into the enterocyte just by diffusion. So passive diffusion happens when nutrients simply cross into the enterocyte without a carrier or energy. So some of the nutrients that do that are lipids, water, vitamin C, and many of our minerals. Facilitated diffusion is still diffusion, so happening along the concentration gradient, but it's facilitated, right? It's sort of directed or supported. That means we need a carrier protein, right? Still no energy, but we need a carrier protein. One of the most famous nutrients that uses facilitated diffusion to be absorbed is fructose. Hopefully you can remember that because they both have an F, right? So fructose does need a carrier protein to actually enter the enterocyte. That's why some people um, like high fructose corn syrup or other I feel like we've kind of reduced our use of fructose so much in sweetening, but maybe in the early 2000s or so, we did use a lot more fructose as a sweetener because we were thinking that it wouldn't contribute so much to caloric load because it's not as readily absorbed. But we find a lot of people wind up with a lot of GI distress from taking too much um, isolated fructose. And part of that's because it's, it is slower absorption, so then it's just lingering in the small intestine longer. 
um, okay, then the two types of absorption that require energy, there's active transport and then endocytosis. So active transport says active, right? That should pretty easily um, indicate to us that it requires energy and the carrier protein. So some of the nutrients that um, absorb via active transport are glucose, amino acids, and some of our minerals. Glucose and amino acids are two of the most critical, well, they're all, all nutrients are critical to the body, right? But glucose are the basic units of carbohydrate. This is like our fuel. And then amino acids are the basic units of protein. So we need the amino acids to build new proteins in our bodies. And then lastly, we have endocytosis and pinocytosis. This is sort of like where a cell, like the enterocyte will kind of engulf, like eat, and just like, kind of like Pac-Man, like open up and eat the nutrient, or pinocytosis, which we kind of refer to as drinking. But either way, it's active, it requires energy, and it's where the cells, again, literally kind of engulf the products um, and like absorb them then into the cell membrane. So we do endocytosis with some larger proteins and other large particles like antibodies um, that again, we get from the mother's breast milk when we're infants. Here are the four types of absorption, passive and facilitated diffusion. So you'll see the main difference is the carrier protein still working down the concentration gradient. Active transport requires energy and the carrier protein. And then endocytosis, you'll see the cell membrane will kind of like go inward and just kind of then collapse um, and actually kind of section off the cell membrane. Part of that cell membrane will just sort of like wrap itself into the cell and that's how it gets absorbed. And then the third part we said of eating is transportation of nutrients and waste products. So transportation happens in the blood and the lymph, right? Blood is the cardiovascular system and lymph is the lymphatic system. We mentioned the capillaries, which are like sort of the end, end, the tiny little end spindles of the blood for the cardiovascular system and lacteal are the tiny little end portions of the lymph. Um, and they're tiny and they're kind of end portions because they're small enough to make their way into those villi folds and get really close to the enterocytes so that they can then receive the um, products of digestion from the enterocytes. So lacteals pick up mostly lipids and fat soluble vitamins. The lymph system is more fat friendly, I guess. The blood is water based, so a lot of our fat or lipid molecules don't travel as easily. They do ultimately travel in the blood, but it's not as straightforward. So the lacteals pick up the, lymph, the lipids and other fat soluble vitamins. And also in the lymph system or the lymphatic system is where we have lymph nodes, which are clusters of immune cells, um, which can relate to digestion, right? If we happen to absorb a microbe or other harmful agent, that would get absorbed into the lymph and perhaps be delivered to a lymph node where it could hopefully be degraded or broken down. Um, and then the lymph system and the cardiovascular system work with each other all the time, right? So they're kind of continually um, interchanging particles. Um, and again, both in the processes of nutrient transportation and um, getting rid of waste products. So let's talk a little bit more, let's kind of revisit the concept of the muscles of the GI tract. So remember we talked about peristalsis, which is moving contents from one area to another, moves contents from one area to the next. We said the esophagus and the large intestine do a lot of peristalsis. Segmentation is a different type of muscular action, happens primarily in the large and small intestines. Um, and segmentation here increases the contact of the chyme with the digestive enzymes. So again, segmentation is a little bit of like trying to, um, kind of helping with digestion, I mean, it's all helping with digestion, but segmentation is a, a little bit of mixing. Um, and then we have circular, the two types of muscles we have are circular and longitudinal. Um, so they contract and relax to mix the chyme um, and enhance its contact with the digestive juices and enterocytes. 
So here's peristalsis, right? Movement from one, movement kind of linearly from one area to the next. Segmentation, again, we see this in the small and large intestine as we're kind of mixing stuff up so that the chyme, the chyme which is the digestive products, and the digestive juices can mix together. And so in segmentation, you see, ultimately you get smaller and smaller and smaller contents of digestion, right? Um, another important facet of the muscles of the GI tract is this con uh, are these haustra, right? These segmentations of the colon, which contract kind of like peristalsis, but a little more slowly to move the contents along. So haustra, and there's a picture here. Oh, I don't have a picture of the haustra. Your book does, I think. Sorry about that. Your book does have a picture of the haustra. They're just sort of like rings. They look like rings along the colon. And again, they function similar to the process they do peristalsis, right? So they help move the contents along just a little more slowly. Mass movement is a term um, that refers to the movement of the waste products toward the rectum. So like getting ready for a poop, getting ready for a bowel movement. Um, the rate of muscle contraction depends on where it is in the GI tract and to the presence of food. So you've maybe noticed that, right? Like, um, I guess I could say personally, in the morning, right? I think most people have a bowel movement or sometime in the morning. Um, and maybe you pay attention, like if you eat something, just a piece of fruit or something, does that, does that presence of food trigger a bowel movement relatively soon? You're not, you're not having a bowel movement of the fruit you just ate. You're having a bowel movement of some of the food you ate yesterday. Um, and then there are also voluntary and involuntary muscles, right? So we have voluntary muscles in the mouth Right, that's pretty obvious, right? The muscles of the mouth. We don't just, <laughs> you know, that'd be funny. Think about if your mouth just suddenly started chewing for you, right? You know, those are voluntary muscles, right? They're they're cognitively, consciously controlled. The muscles of the rest of the GI tract are not consciously controlled, right? Those are they happen based on the the presence of food. Right? So we don't think, okay, stomach, start turning, right? Okay, pancreas, release your digestive juices. That's all happening involuntarily. Um, the stomach has both longitudinal, circular, and diagonal muscles. Again, partly just due to the shape of the organ and because there's so much mixing that has to happen there. Whereas the small intestine and large intestine are much more tubular, so they primarily have longitudinal move along and circular to do some of that mixing. Okay, a little bit more about the nervous system. So the enteric nervous system has to do with the digestive organs. Um, it's a branch of the peripheral nervous system, which is part of the autonomic nervous system, right? Um, the, enteric, the enteric nervous system, like when I referred to the vagus nerve earlier, it's localized primarily in that submucosa, remember, just behind the mucus, and also, of course, in the muscularis layer, because the nervous, the nerve signals in signal muscular contraction. So the enteric nervous system controls the contraction and secretions of the GI tract. Um, communication, so the enteric nervous system communicates with the central nervous system of the brain and spinal cord, via the peripheral nervous system, right? So peripheral, central nervous system is brain and spinal cord, peripheral is pretty much everything else. Um, and the autonomic nervous system is composed, right, of the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches. So parasympathetic stimulation inhibits GI function. Sorry, I said that backwards. Sympathetic nervous system inhibits GI function, right? Sympathetic is like fight or flight. Right? Where you're like, oh shit, I gotta run or fight this bear. Right? So if you're running or fighting a bear, your body's not too interested in digesting. There might be food in there, right? If you just ate and then suddenly a bear is attacking you, or you just ate and you're stressed out about something in life, huh? Stress, it's the same system. So your digestion is gonna be impaired. 
Whereas parasympathetic, this is rest and digest, right? This is like, oh, cool, I'm calm, I'm relaxed, I'm eating my meal. My body can actually digest it, right? So parasympathetic stimulates digestion. There's so much more we could say here. Um, unfortunately, we could have a whole class on this, a whole like semester long course. But read this section in the book too. Um, it should give you a little bit more comprehensive understanding here. But again, just recognizing that there is really intense, really thorough communication between the brain and the digestive system. And the communication goes both directions, right? So if you're not feeling too well down here, you're not gonna feel too well up here in your head. Similarly, if you're not feeling too well in your head, right, you're stressed, you're anxious, you're angry, you're upset, your digestive system isn't gonna be going so smoothly, right? So that's really important. Um, our psychology and our physiology work hand in hand, all day, every day. Alrighty, um, this would be another place to pause if you wanted to take a pause. Um, last thing we're gonna do here for chapter three is talk about some digestive related disorders. So your book lists a bunch of them. Some of them are really kind of simple like belching and farting, um, and some of them are a little more severe. So we'll start with belching and flatulence. Belching is burping, right? Primarily caused by swallowed air, which usually happens from eating too fast. Um, you might also swallow air if you're chewing gum or if you have braces or dentures, uh, that might also impair your ability to really chew and swallow well. Flatulence is gas, it's also a normal process. We might have more flatulence if we're eating more foods rich in fiber, starch, and sugar. Some of that flatulence is, is again really normal, actually part of the bacterial fermentation of the fiber, but we can also have like excessive and sometimes stinky flatulence, especially if we eat too much added sugar. Um, again, a lot of the flatulence might come from the bacteria. And if it's if you don't have a lot of flatulence or if you have flatulence that's not odorous, that's probably a great sign, right? That you probably have really healthy, happy bacteria. Um, and then some other components of our food like um, fat substitutes, so foods that might contain some trans fats or foods that might contain, again, added sugar or sugar alcohols, usually going to disturb the gut microbiome and cause a little more stinky and some maybe even painful flatulence. Okay, getting a little, well, flatulence can be a good early warning sign, <laughs> um, but getting a little more severe, we have heartburn and gastroesophageal reflux disease. So remember that the stomach is producing hydrochloric acid and the lining of the stomach has that mucosal barrier to protect it from the acid but other parts of the GI tract do not have that protective mucosal layer. Remember, even in the pancreas, there isn't a protective layer of mucus. There is a little mucus layer, but it's not protective against the hydrochloric acid. It was that the pancreas secreted bicarbonate into the small intestine to neutralize the acid. So heartburn happens when, when the contents of the stomach do move backwards up into the esophagus. And so the esophagus literally gets burned by the hydrochloric acid. We call it heartburn because if you remember the image that showed the digestive organs, stomachs are right below your heart and the esophagus is right behind, you know, it's right in the kind of in the middle of your um, upper, your chest area. So that burning sensation is in the esophagus, but we kind of feel like it's in the heart, but it's actually in the esophagus. So that's why we call it heartburn, but it's really esophagus burn. So heartburn and GERD are directly related because um, GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease. So gastro stomach esophageal reflux, right, backwards. So GERD is that like dysfunction of the gastroesophageal valve or sphincter. So that's where you get that painful, persistent heartburn. Heart, let me say one more thing here. Heartburn could happen like once, like you ate too much and you're actually, your stomach isn't digesting. Your stomach is digesting slow at its normal pace, but you put so much food in there, they're getting a little bit of like backward movement and back into the esophagus. So that could be heartburn once periodically. But then prolonged and persistent heartburn, it might be due to this reflux disease or GERD, or maybe that valve isn't functioning quite right. 
Or maybe you're just constantly overeating and constantly overstressing your stomach, so you're constantly getting that reflux. Or you're also eating things that you're not tolerating so well, and your stomach's like, ah, yeah, ah, get this out of here. That can also be a cause of reflux or GERD or heartburn. So this is just showing you again, your heart is like right here. Here's the muscles of your diaphragm. Your stomach's right there. Your esophagus is right there. So when you get that acidic passage of, of hydrochloric acid and chyme back into your esophagus, it burns right about in the region of your heart. So it has nothing to do with your heart, but we think it's there. Causes of GERD. So a lot of these, again, are behavioral. These are choices we make. Um, the only one that isn't is having a hiatal hernia, right? Where you have um, like a hernia of the, kind of like an outgrowth of the stomach that actually passes through the diaphragm. That can hurt, right? So then you're, you're getting pain in that region because of that hernia, pain in the heart region. Um, smoking or alcohol, being overweight. Pregnancy can also cause GERD just because the, um, as the uterus grows and grows and grows with the baby, it actually pushes and kind of collapses or condenses our digestive organs. So you might have greater incidence of GERD. Again, some foods that we just might overreact to, um, a large meal or a lot of fat in a meal, and also laying down too soon after a meal. So big takeaway from this slide is that GERD is very preventable, right? And if you have GERD, you can treat it yourself <laughs> just by changing some of your behaviors. Okay, ulcers. So peptic ulcers are areas of the GI tract that have been eroded by hydrochloric acid and pepsin. So an ulcer, do I have an image? Ooh, yeah. So here's an image of an ulcer, right? So the, in this inner layer, this mucosal layer, and even the submucosal layer of your digestive organ gets eroded, right? Like chewed away by the hydrochloric acid. Um, there's also a bacteria that can cause this, which is H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori, um, can play a role in both gastric and duodenal ulcers. Ulcers can also be caused by prolonged use of NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So just be aware of if you've been using an NSAID for too long and maybe switch to a different pain reliever that isn't an NSAID. And also some medications. Uh, can you use same medications to treat GERD? Oh, yeah. Right. So um, again, a lot of this has to do with the, S the acid. So a lot of medications that would treat GERD or treat an ulcer are going to reduce your body's production of hydrochloric acid. Maybe not great to be on long term, right, because you need hydrochloric acid for digestion, but certainly can be used to kind of treat a bad ulcer in the short term. Um, we had thought for a while that maybe ulcers were caused by stress or spicy foods, and I guess in my opinion, we can't rule those out entirely, but we definitely need to pay attention to the fact that they're most often actually caused by bacteria. So there's the peptic ulcer, and then digestive, other digestive disorders, so gallstones. So these are crystallized deposits of either cholesterol or bilirubin that form in the gallbladder. So that can also be can be painful, or it could be asymptomatic, meaning no pain or symptoms at all. But it can become painful if it obstructs the bile duct, so the little duct that connects the gallbladder to the um, duodenum, right? So the duct through which the bile passes. Unfortunately, treatment often involves removing the gallbladder. Um, and so post-gallbladder, I forget what they call that exactly, gallbladderectomy, there's, a, there's actually a word for that. Um, but if your gallbladder gets removed, then um, usually the way your body will eventually adapt is that the liver will um, send bile into the duodenum via the common bile duct instead of via the gallbladder. These are some examples of some really relatively large gallstones. Um, you'll see compared to the size of a dime and compared to the size of like a chickpea, right? So really large deposits of bilirubin and cholesterol, some of them a little bit smaller, but you can imagine those could be quite painful, again, especially if they start to block the ducts. Um, also, let's differentiate between an a food intolerance and a food allergy. 
So an allergy, I like to start there. Food allergy is like a real serious issue, right? It's where your immune system overreacts to a particular food or component of a food, usually a protein in the food. And so someone who has like a real allergy to milk or what else do we have? Like a real allergy to eggs or peanut butter or bees, even it's a reaction to a protein in that food. And so it can be really quite dangerous if the person has does ingest that food um, because the immune system responds, right? And can, you know, it's a hypersensitivity and a hyper reaction. So the immune system might respond so intensely that it can be um, like threatening if not addressed immediately. But food intolerance is a little less serious, but a, an intolerance is basically a bunch of different symptoms that occur after you eat a certain food, right? So gas, pain, or diarrhea, right? So it's sort of like, well, maybe just don't eat that food or eat it less frequently or eat it in smaller portions. For whatever reason, your body isn't loving that food, isn't digesting it quite right or very well. So ha don't have it or have it less frequently or have smaller parts or portions of it. Um, but a food intolerance, again, you're still going to see some of the like basic symptoms of your immune system working. But it's, it's again, just things like pain, um, maybe some bloating, like maybe a little inflammation, but it's not a full-blown immune response. Celiac disease, another pretty serious one. So celiac disease is where your body reacts to... Um, proteins in wheat, rye, and barley, which we commonly refer to as gluten. And gluten is actually a component of a larger protein called gliadin. So in this case, um, the body just does not tolerate gluten or gliadin. And we can see, um, again, kind of a full-blown immune response here. So, there, so far, we don't really know a cure for celiac disease, aside from just staying away from wheat, rye, and barley, these foods that contain gluten. Um, as celiac disease progresses, what we see is pretty severe damage to those enterocytes that line the small intestine. And so um, poorly managed celiac disease can really interfere with or lead to poor nutrient absorption because those enterocytes are so damaged. Um, the enterocytes are damaged and also the villi decrease in size, which is really interesting, right? So those deep grooves that allow for better absorption, they just kind of shrink. Right? So that's part of why nutrient absorption becomes less effective or efficient. Um, also worth noting, there is a sensitivity to gluten that is non-celiac, right? So kind of like an intolerance, right? So the signs and symptoms are nonspecific and can vary greatly. And there are no precise biomarkers, whereas the slide doesn't say it, but there is a, a biomarker for celiac disease. So you can be very clearly diagnosed with celiac disease. So if you get tested for celiac and you're not diagnosed, Maybe you just have sensitivity, right? So you still might get an immune response to gluten um, or other components of wheat or rye or barley. Um, not celiac gluten sensitivity might also just be an intolerance to some of the short chain carbohydrates, which you've maybe seen this acronym FODMAPS, which is fructo, oligo, and disaccharides. Um, and then polyols. So we'll talk a little more about that when we talk about carbohydrates in chapter four. Again, in my opinion, this is usually an intolerance. Uh, if you have kind of an intolerance to these fermentable carbohydrates, it's usually an underlying gut dysbiosis. So usually addressing, again, the quality of your overall diet as well as your gut microbiome, in my opinion, is a good way to kind of treat this for the long term. So, and again, I guess I kind of say that here. So if you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, um, what you might look at is reducing the intake of processed foods, eat a greater variety of fiber-rich foods, 
which again would be different varieties of beans, grains, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds. Maybe also reduce meat and dairy, um, as these can also be inflammatory in the gut and cause kind of exacerbate the symptoms here. Vomiting, right? So vomiting is again when we get that backwards peristalsis, where the contents of the stomach move back up into the esophagus. There's also something called cyclic vomiting syndrome. This is a vomiting that um, reoccurs for more than several hours or might even last for a few days. Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease is another inflammatory bowel disease similar to celiac. Um, the causes of Crohn's disease are also a little less well known, although oftentimes probably stress, again, brain to gut, right? Probably stress, probably poor diet over a long period of time, um, maybe not having frequent enough or productive enough bowel movements. Those potentially could be some of the causes. Um, maybe there's also a reaction to a virus or a bacteria, but again, in a, in a healthy body, we should be able to pass that virus or bacteria out, you know, at least within a few weeks, if not within a few days. So ongoing Crohn's disease, again, oftentimes you might consider the health of the gut and the health of what you're, the healthfulness of what you're eating. So symptoms of Crohn's include diarrhea, abdominal pain, potentially rectal bleeding, could be weight loss, fever, and even anemia, which can cause, be caused by a number of different nutrient deficiencies. Um, yeah, so Crohn's may very well be due to an overgrowth of some of those harmful viruses or bacteria, viruses or bacteria in the large intestine. Um, and so then you might be having, the person might really be having a hard time getting rid of them because the way to get rid of them is to repopulate the healthy gut microbes. Um, ulcerative colitis, again, an inflammatory bowel or inflammatory digestive issue. So here the inflammation is uh, part of the digestive tract. Crohn's dis chronic disease characterized by inflammation and ulceration of the mucosa, the innermost lining of the colon. Yeah, so ulcerative colitis in the colon and could potentially lead to ulcers of the colon. Again, could be in response to overgrowth of harmful virus or bacteria. Similar symptoms to Crohn's, you might have to avoid certain foods for a little while. And again, a similar treatment of just addressing the overall gut microbiome and the healthfulness of what we eat. Diarrhea, right? So frequent, loose, watery stools not held together well. Common causes, again, could be an infection in the GI tract, a bacteria overgrowth or virus, stress, remember gut brain. Again, a food intolerance as we just saw, a reaction to a medication, or any of the bowel disorders we just looked at. Ongoing and really severe diarrhea can de lead to dehydration. That's really important to look out for. So that becomes, dehydration becomes really serious for children and elderly, right? Who are more susceptible to dehydration more qu quickly. So look out for prolonged or really severe diarrhea in children and elderly. We can also sometimes get traveler's diarrhea. Um, which again is often caused by a bacteria or a virus that our body isn't familiar with. And the body's trying to expel it, right? That's what, that's, usually, that's sometimes what diarrhea is, is trying to just expel a foreign particle. Um, sometimes diarrhea can also be improved ultimately by increasing soluble fibers. Um, Cause sometimes we're having diarrhea, maybe not so much for any of these reasons, but just because our stool isn't really held well together. And that's the job of soluble fiber. We'll talk more about that in chapter four. Um, signs and symptoms of dehydration in adults and children. So particularly again in infants and children, these are important signs to look out for. So maybe no tears when they're crying, not peeing frequently, you know, less frequently than every three hours. Um, a little lethargic, not having a lot of energy, sunken eyes, cheeks, or soft spots on the skull, dry skin, dry mouth. Um, in, headache, uh, in adults, maybe more headaches or fainting. So look out for these signs of dehydration. Again, especially if it's uh, any time, but especially if there's 
diarrhea going on, look for these symptoms and help rehydrate the child or the adult. Constipation, the opposite of diarrhea, right? So having infrequent bowel movements that are usually hard, really small, like little rabbit pellets, and difficult to pass, right? So in this case, constipation is usually treated by increasing both soluble and insoluble fibers, which we generally get from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Also, fluid is usually lack of water intake, so poor hydration is usually a good cause of constipation. Also, lack of regular physical activity is often a cause of constipation. So again, behavioral changes can improve this one. And then irritable bowel syndrome, so kind of a collection of disorders that interfere with normal colon function. Symptoms would be cramping in the abdomen, right? You're not pooping, right? So you're gonna cramp there. Might be bloating, because you're probably not pooping, right? Um, usually constipation goes with IBS, but it could also be diarrhea. So if there's diarrhea, there might be a lot of, in, in either case actually, there might be a lot of inflammation along the colon both of which can lead to that cramping and that bloating feeling. IBS is strongly associated with stress, again, gut brain. Um, excessive caffeine intake, which for a lot of people is just two cups, <laughs> 16 ounces. Large meals, for sure. Alcohol. For a lot of people, dairy and wheat. And some people, chocolate. So it's not even so much that we have to eliminate for some people, we do have to eliminate some of these foods, but for a lot of people, it's even just having smaller portions or having them less frequently. Treatment for IBS typically involves stress management, getting physical activity, eating smaller meals, eating more fiber, again, from your whole plant foods, being better hydrated, and potentially if it's wheat related, following this low FODMAP diet. Cancer in the GI system, so another um, disorder in the GI system. So cancer can develop in any region, right? The gallbladder, the liver, the pancreas. The most common is in the rectum, the colon and the rectum. Risk factors, so things that increase our risk for cancer in the GI system. Smoking, being overweight, not being physically active, diets high in red and processed meats. So again, not to say that red or processed meat causes cancer, although I guess we, we do know that they do, but especially if we eat a lot of them. So if we're eating red or processed meat every day, like steak or pig or deli meats, those are common processed meats, deli meats, those are cancer promoting foods. Um, as well as diets that are low in calcium, fruits and vegetables and whole grains. These are foods that provide a lot of fiber and a lot of water, as well as a host of other nutrients that are um, provide antioxidation. We'll learn about that in unit three. So fiber and antioxidants are critical to actually slowing the process of cancer or even reversing the process of cancer and keeping that colon healthy and clean. So a colonoscopy can detect cancer or precancerous polyps, little growths in the colon, um, and screenings for colorectal cancers are recommended starting at age 50. Again, all of the risk factors for colorectal cancer are lifestyle. These are all modifiable. These are all behaviors that we each have the capacity to change. Okay, so that's it for chapter three. The last bit here, as with all lectures, will be um, the little question and answer. So um, I'll thumb through these slides, pause them to kind of figure out the answer yourself and then play to the next slide. If you have any questions at all, as always, please email me. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next for chapter four.